topics like uh, I I saw his work on trade, then the sciences, then uh, on these uh, different kind of methodologies also. So in a very very vast area of uh, uh, issues he has uh, dealt with. So uh, I again once again uh, welcome Devesh for uh, you to agreeing to our request on uh, dealing with such an important topic of like. Uh, uh, propensities for uh, matching then CM and as you just rightly pointed out that there have been a very fast evolution of literature in terms of you know integration of different methods also and uh, that's good that you are updating our students on those aspects so without uh, wasting time I uh, straight away I welcome you and I just uh, call upon you to please uh, uh, start the uh, session thank you yeah thank you for visiting it just uh... Always a pleasure to be talking and presenting for uh, IARI. I mean, and what the the students. I mean, uh, I wish we were there in person. Yes. But uh, uh, if that's not the say, this is the second best. And you know, as economists, we always have to appreciate the second best equilibrium, right? So this is what it is. Uh, so what uh, I'm going to uh, talk about is, uh, and why I brought in the second best is. Basically, what we are going to talk about propensities for matching for impact evaluation. This is also kind of what it will be a second best method. So to say what we are going to uh, be doing for impact evaluation, because economists and the social scientists have kind of zeroed on as a, as a, a randomized uh, trials as a, as the gold standard or the first best. Uh, so uh, let me just. Uh, uh, so let me just, you know, I'll do a little bit of a back step and then just getting into the things. I know you have to, uh, as ordered, we have, we have to supposed to talk about impact evaluation and uh, uh, like PSM in particular, the propensity score matching. Uh, but I think it's mandatory to just have a little bit of a background of to just to place this whole idea of when we are thinking about from a matching estimation perspective. So it's it's kind of, when I say backstepping, it's actually we need to know uh, what is the central problem of impact evaluation. Uh, and then I'll, you'll also come to the remark that I was making that is going to be like second best method. But, uh, you know, just like you'd have learned from uh, COVID uh, time that you will have to adjust to a lot of second best things, right? And uh, so, uh, because the context would be like that, where you'll have to uh, uh, appreciate this method, utilize them. So, you know, the whole problem of impact evaluation, you can just uh, bring it into uh, two, two factors. One are the, what we call as confounding factors, and the others are selection by. These are the core problems of impact evaluation. What you're going to try and do is try and address, how do you take care of these confounding factors? and the selection bias. So think about a confounding factor. So I'd want to know the outcome of any program, any intervention on something like say incomes. But if there are other factors apart from the program that will also affect the incomes, then those will be confounding factors. They confound, right? The selection bias is that it depends on who gets into the program. Suppose if the smarter people get into the program and uh, uh, and you say that the outcome is because of uh, then if you uh, if you uh, get the smarter people into the program and you see that the, pro the participants have much better outcome, is it because of the program or is it because of the people who got into the program were smarter to begin with? So that's the selection bias. And remember, we are trying to address it from an economics point of view. That means we want to identify. Identify is about two things, about quantification and attribution. So we want to attribute this to the program. The program what has done precisely, program by itself, not something else. And then want to quantify because how much it is, right? And uh, so, uh, so what does uh, an impact evaluation do? That's why I said we need a, need a little bit of side uh, backstepping to do this. So what does uh, uh, impact evaluation, what does impact evaluation do? 
So let me just read it out. It measures the effect of the program on its beneficiaries and eventually on non-beneficiaries by answering a counterfactual question. Just excuse me for a minute. So, yeah, sorry. So, uh, so the idea that if you want to know the counterfactual questions, the, the how would individuals who participated in a program would have fared in the absence of the program? That's the core of impact evaluation question. You want to know that if this program were not there, what would be the outcome? So it's a counterfactual question. If you do it on the non-beneficiary side, then the question is how would those who were not exposed to the program have fared in the absence of the program? So, and as I said, that there would be two main problems that may arise when you want to answer these two questions, which are the core questions in impact evaluation. And those are just subsumed in this, you can summarize or subsumed in these two problems, the confounding factors and selection bias. This is what you want to address in impact evaluation. So, so now, one of the uh, question that uh, the way who on who you are going to look at the impact. So suppose you some of you are in a treatment that you get into a program, you get you are a beneficiary to a program. Some others are not. Can we go to each of those individuals who are beneficiaries and say this is the impact on individual A, this is the impact on individual B, this is the impact on individual C. And if anybody says that that is. Uh, technically wrong, that is, that is never technically possible. Because as I said, there's a counterfactual question. So from a counterfactual perspective, you need to know the same person at the same time without the program. The person who is in a program to know what will be the counterfactual, that person has to be not in the program at the same time that he's in the program and that is Humanly not possible, only gods can have it, right? So that's why you can never get a impact on each individual who are part of the, the program. So this is what, you know, the econometricians will call as a missing data problem. You can never observe the same individual in a treatment as well as not in a treatment at the same time. So this is a missing data problem. So you cannot do an impact you cannot assess on each individual. Anybody who says that is, doesn't know anything about impact evaluation, to be honest. I mean, uh, so what you can do instead that, you know, uh, what the econometrician, what statisticians can do, they can tell you about an average impact on an average, on a group of individuals, on a group of beneficiaries, what is the impact? So this is the first core thing that you can never have any impact that you are going to assess on each individual or each beneficiary. That is that you know your main job in trying to do an impact evaluation because you can never get a counterfactual for the same individual, but you can get a counterfactual for a group of individuals by comparing the mean outcome in the group of participation to similar people who have not participated. So that can give you a counterfactual and that can give you an average impact. It can never give you an individual impact on an individual. And that's why the term that is used is a bit of a mouthful. Uh, the what you're going to have is called the average, and you mark my words clearly here, is average treatment effect. I have not written the full thing, but it says average treatment effect of the treatment on the treated. So all the time that you would be really trying to get, be it uh, from the randomized control trial, be it from uh, your other method that one of which we are doing today, be, be, and you know, they have done uh, uh, as part of this program, you would have done regression discontinuity environment might be coming. In all this, what you're going to estimate is this ATT, average treatment effect of the treatment on the treated. Never ever we are going to have an impact on an individual or a single beneficiary. It is not technically possible. So then the question is we said, okay, take a group of beneficiary, group of individual, 
find a compar group, comparative group that were very similar and some in are in treatment, the group is in a treatment and the, some are not in a treatment, so they form the counterfactual. Then the question arises, who is comparable? What group is comparable? And these are the terms about treatment and control group. Treatment, those who are beneficiary or part of the program, control group who are basically trying to give you the counterfactual who are not part of the treatment, not a part of the program. So what happens is that if you look at every time that individuals who will be part of the program, they should be most commonly, you will find that they are not very similar to the people who are outside the program. There could be many reasons. They can be either external selection or they can be self-selection, external selection that the program say that we can, uh, we are going to target only people from certain caste. We are only going to target women. We are only going to target tribal community. Uh, that is external selection. Uh, we are only going to target students who have a certain grade in the exam and they are, they are qualified for this program, the others are not. But more importantly, they can also be self-selection. Even if you don't do an external targeting like that, the people can self-select into programs. They, you know, think about Narega. And you say you want to look at the impact of Narega. Narega, there's a huge amount of self-selection. It's a bag, backbone breaking work in the sun that you have to break stones and so on, whatever is there. Some people who have no other option might choose for it. There will be a self-selection. So they would definitely be different from the people who do not join the Narega program. So assuming that the participation is voluntary, nobody's putting a gun on their head that you have to go into the program. So this is what would be your selection bias. So if you look at the just the people who are in the program and not in the program, you will know that they have been selected either because of external selection or they have been selected through self-selection. So they would have certain outcomes is it because based on the reason for selection, not because of the program. So that is the core problem that you got from selection bias. So, so here is a depiction of that. And this will also form the core of your, what you'll have in impact evaluation. So here is the big circle is your kind of the target population. And uh, when are you going to do an impact evaluation? You're not going to do a census and go to every, many a times it's technically financially not feasible. What you're going to do is through, through all, uh, you know, even if you do the consumer household survey, you do not do a census all the time, you will do a sampling. So from an impact evaluation perspective, you look at the figure, and this is what in impact evaluation is called the external validity and internal validity of your impact evaluation uh, mechanism. So if you look at the two small circles, which are treatment and control, which are the samples, that you from the treatment group, you sam sample some people, from the control group, you sample some people, and this, this is the target population, the bigger circle. So on, on average, if you look at these are the, you know, the circle dots tell you the characteristic of uh, the, uh, the population and the uh, treatment group and the control group. So on average, they are, they are looking very similar. So this is the case in which you will not have a selection bias. So if the two small circles are very similar to each other, that is what in impact evaluation you call as the basis for internal validity that the treatment group and control group are on average similar. But that's what randomization does it like, you know, because what does randomize the central limit theorem will tell you that, you know, if you do random sampling, that on an average, those people who are included and those who go, go outside will be similar. This is the theory of statistics. So if you do a random sample, and then if your two circles on average would be similar, that is the treatment group and the control group, that would be your internal validity. And they are also similar, both of them, to the larger circle, which is the target population, from where the samples are drawn, that's your external validity. That is, uh, you know, whatever you do through your, uh, these samples and evaluation, that will apply to a wider population because it is representative of that. And that's your uh, external validity of an impact evaluation. If you look at this, this case, this one is neither internally validated nor externally validated because the treatment and control group are on average different from each other. And the both of them are different from the population from which they are drawn. So this would be what you want to avoid. This is a selection bias here when you do this. And that will show up in the impact that if you 
have a negative selection in you or you have a positive uh, po uh, so the point is that if you have got suppose the smarter people got into the uh, in the treatment group then your outcomes will be overestimated you will be saying that this is because of the program but part of it is because of their smartness so this selection bias that you saw in those circles will just start playing out here the opposite will happen if you have negative selection you will have an underestimation there will be a bias right so that's where you know you uh, you will have an not an internally valid and not externally valid uh, evaluation design and that will give you a bias and remember what we started with we said we are going to look at it from an economics point of view we are not uh, saying oh they look uh, very similar uh, it is basically that we need to there is a question of identification and attribution that whatever we measure should be attributed to the treatment itself if you see the difference of say 50% suppose in income between the treatment group and control group our objective to say is out of that 50% what how what amount is precisely because of the intervention because of the program uh, i mean just comparing the two groups and on an average they that's not enough because we are going to have uh, uh, identification and attribution issues right so so this is uh, that's what he said that we know one is uh, one bit that we need a quantitative method because we are trying to do attribution and identification uh, and the second bit that we want to emphasize which you will get from randomization if you do randomization randomization is a double difference method right you take a baseline data randomly selected treatment group randomly selected uh, control group and then you take the difference and then you take an end line data and then you take the difference of the difference the change in uh, uh, the outcome variable for the treatment and control at the baseline period and the treatment and control in the end line period and then take the difference of the two differences that's called double difference so uh, i mean why i brought in double difference from before because we will try to see the segue from uh, propensity score matching starting from a cross sectional data are uh, trying to improve upon this and uh, one of the pathways to improve this would be to make it a double difference propensity score matching because and we'll uh, argue why double difference is important so this is just uh, you can see that you know double difference would be suppose intervention group is i control group is c zero is the baseline period one is the end line period then i1 minus c1 is the end line period difference between treatment group and control group outcomes minus the difference between the treatment group and control group in the uh, base period and the difference of those two difference is the double difference so so think about that there are now what are the there there's a width and without element because there is a treatment and a control and then there is a before and after element because one is a baseline one is the end line and we will try to argue why double difference is important and that so this is just a graphical depiction of it i'm not going into this so suppose you collected data only from beneficiaries and you just focus on one dimension that is before and after so uh, and many people do that right this is uh, i see a lot of paper in criminology they will do a before and after uh, comparison and say after the police force was uh, increased the uh, the crime went down by so much the idea now think about from an agriculture agriculture technology adoption perspective which is kind of the uh, the thematic around which this all this uh, conversation is there so now if you look at and you you intervene and then what happens that you know and then you collect data at the end of the intervention with the end line period suppose in between some drought happened so your outcome would be for the benefit you're only looking at one dimension before and after so what will happen is then uh, you the you will see that the treatment group individual uh, had like a reduced uh, income or reduced productivity everything being uh, because the drought happened now this is because we are looking at only one difference before and after now suppose there was another another group which was the control group and they were looking at the difference over time they are in this their comparator group they are in the same location and all the drought they will affect them as well so if you look at double difference in the growth in income 
of the treatment group, if it is better than the say growth in income or productivity of the control group, then you might begin to think that there was some benefit from the intervention. Because is being now that will be the confounding factor. Now the confounding factor will be like a drought. And remember, we have been saying that these are the these are, these are the two essence elements of uh, of evaluation. Which is if you take care of this, that's what you strive for. Which is uh, uh, confounding factors and selection biases, which we were uh, talking about. So, so if you do a before and after program to an open and then with and without, that's your difference in difference estimation. If you also select, are able to assign the treatment. Uh, randomly, you'll get a randomized uh, treatment effect, which will be like an RCT and all, which will also call an experimental method. And uh, so this is, uh, and now that will, if you look at the issue of agriculture technology, then the technology adoption is actually going to, is meant to spread to the control group. And that is how you will not have like this, uh, treatment and control group uh, being so uh, bifurcated and say so you can just uh, you can begin to see the complication that will start creeping in from the point of view of identification and attribution uh, so so if we could do an rct or if you could do a randomized trial which we were saying that we were having a conversation before we started this uh, when he says okay then that would be like your first best method you could do experimental method now, uh, but if you, uh, and these are often very difficult, think about if the government is trying to implement a program and it says, I will select the beneficiaries randomly. I mean, uh, in a democracy that is going to be uh, really the hell will break loose. Uh, it's very expensive also. Uh, and plus even in without expensive and even when it, there's so many, even the Nobel prizes were given for people who did all these RCT, but to have a true randomized al uh, allocation it is very, very difficult. Now, if you think about all the things that, you know, Esther Duflo or Abhijit Banerjee, they did this, all these experiments with Seva Mandir schools in, uh, in Udaipur, and they did experiment after experiment. So the point is that how was Seva Mandir, was it randomly selected? Seva Mandir because Abhijit Banerjee and all had their, their friends there, Ashok Rai and all, and they could do these experiments there. It was not randomly selected Seva Mandir. It was not a random, so it, from that arm of randomization was never in place. Uh, but it's, you know, in the randomization, the issue is that, you know, all the people sitting in America or outside are doing it. It's pretty accepted and they always do it in countries like India or Africa and all. So there's a whole lot, amount of asymmetry problem, but, uh, but technically if randomization were possible and with true randomization were there, it will give you uh, the internal validity as well as the external validity. But suppose that is not possible, which is most in many cases is not possible, then you're not going to be in an experimental world. And in an experimental world, it can be either you doing a randomized control trial, or sometimes the nature moves and divides people into some group and then the other group, like maybe an earthquake or a storm affects some people and doesn't affect other people. So it's randomly done, right? Uh, it can bifurcate people and it can uh, put the people into two different groups. So that those are called natural experiments. So either through randomized control trials or through natural experiment, you can get this bifurcation. But if you are, don't have that luxury, which we often we do not have, then we have to rely on what we'll call as non-experimental or quasi-experimental method. Quasi-experimental, why we are using the two terms, non-experimental and quasi-experimental. Quasi-experimental methods are non-experimental, but they try to mimic experimental or randomization. So here, all these effort that we are going to do, we are going to talk today about one of those quasi-experimental method, which is propensity score matching, where our objective is that it's a quasi-experimental that we try to mimic, try to imitate as well as possible uh, to get to randomization, which will give us full internal validity and external validity. And then we can really quantify and attribute the, uh, the impact to a particular treatment, particular program. And I'm not getting into other quasi-experimental method, which I think uh, some other colleagues are going to be teaching here. 
uh, which are regression, discontinuity, and other things. Uh, and I'm not. I'm uh, IV also. I think Sunil is teaching tomorrow, which is instrumental variables. So I'm just going to tell you that it falls in the same class, but it's different. But it has the core principle of a non-experimental and trying to be quasi-experimental in order to mimic the randomization. That is our. So. So the point is. Uh, if you now think in so one of the the earliest way that was th thought about in a quasi experimental method was a covariate matching. So remember what we're saying that we were saying that you know I want to from the treatment group I want to find comparators, people who are comparable in the non beneficiary groups and then we look at the outcomes uh, and then say the difference in the outcomes on average between the people who are in the treatment and similar people in the, in the control group is going to be the impact. But remember, we, I am not yet explained what is meant by similarity. This cannot be similarity because the people look similar. It has to be mathematically, statistically defined. And that's the whole idea of uh, the whole exercise about what we are going to do in uh, matching. So the earliest way of doing matching, that is to try find similar people, uh, which is uh, was covariate matching. Covariates are all these characteristics. It could be your age, your education, uh, your occupation, your location, your family composition. So all those things that you would think. So suppose our intervention is about uh, agriculture, productivity, enhancement through technology. So all these things about family composition, your location, your education, uh, your land size, your links, all those things will matter uh, and give you the outcomes. And your intervention is suppose like a training program or distribution of seeds. So you want to know the impact or attribution and you want to identify the impact of precisely that intervention. But all these confounding factors will, uh, will really create problems. So when you do a covariate matching, you're trying to do is that you look at characteristics, you make a judgment. These are the characteristics that will matter for uh, agriculture productivity. It's the land size and it's uh, farmers experience in farming, farmer's age, farmer gender, whatever. Uh, and I'm saying whatever with a purpose. Uh, and so, and then uh, you say, uh, let's look at the people in the control group and based on those characteristics, look who's there like that. And then on an average outcome from the treatment group and control group, the difference between the two is my impact, right? So now, so first thing when you do covariate matching, the first question you should ask that what all covariates, what all characteristics matter, who knows? I mean, I think these characteristics matter then uh, uh, Aditya comes and says, no, these characteristics also matter for technology, uh, for uh, productivity. Uh, then someone else like uh, your Professor Singh says, no, I have done research, gender also matters for uh, uh, agriculture productivity. So, so you know this is unbounded, this is limitless, that you know, uh, what all matters for the outcome, right? That is the problem with covariate matching, right? So this is what is called the curse of dimensionality. That's how the initially things would be done. You will do covariate matching, matching on, you'll say these attributes are important. These characteristics are important for the outcome. Uh, I look at the people with these attributes in the treatment group, these attributes in the control group, look at the average of the outcome in the treatment group, average the outcome in the control group, Take the difference of those outcomes. This is the average treatment effect. So the first thing that you know, the, what will hit you right there in your, in your face, would be the curse of dimensionality. That you know, this is totally unbounded. I mean, uh, I always give the example on these talks is that you know this hammer mesh paper, uh, where it showed that you know the in the labor market, we earning good looking people used to earn more. Now that attribute also mattered. Now here also you should uh, begin to think about uh, how e economics or econometrics or statistics looks at observed and unobserved characteristics. So 
for uh, non economists beauty will be a pure case of observed characteristic for statisticians or for econometrician beauty is an unobserved characteristic as long as you don't have data on it if you have a metric you have a measure for beauty and then you have data on people on the, that measure then it's an observed characteristic but the idea is to drive up the point that through covariate matching you will very soon hit the curse of dimensionality barrier and that is the uh, problem that's why covariate matching is not going to work uh, and then also you know whatever you are going to really um, match on i mean then you'll have to say which are observed characteristics what characteristics matter there are less different layers in it in which you will have to make sure that you are doing a right matching so so how does now the propensity score matching that we are going to address here move from this world so how does this solve the evaluation problem going from covariate matching which has this curse of dimensionality uh, so what the psm or the propensity score matching does in order to solve the evaluation problem is that it constructs a statistical comparison group based on a model of probability of participating in the treatment so what it does it says you have a covariate matching you have multi dimensional unbounded problem multi dimensional because you don't know how many attributes matter how many characteristics matter so what propensity score matching does with rosenbaum and rubin uh, seminal uh, contribution is that they said that what you can do through covariate matching to multi dimensionality of it you can do as well through a unidimensionality of propensity score so they overcame the curse of dimensionality of covariate matching by showing that under a certain assumption we'll come to those assumptions because in everything that you do there will be certain assumptions and you'll have this how binding they are how realistic they are and how uh, you're going to accept or not accept them so it says that you can generate based on this all these characteristics that you think are important you can just generate a probability of participating in the treatment for people both in the treatment group and in the control group and from give you a matching people on each of the covariate each of the characteristic instead of that you could just match people on this one attribute one characteristic which is the propensity score so it becomes a one dimensional problem so you generate the propensity score we have not come to how will you generate but is just for now it is enough to say that propensity score is that the estimated probability of participating in the treatment for both the people in the treatment group as well as in the control group the p is for probability it will be a function of x x are the characteristics based on which you will generate the probability and that probability is the propensity score uh, so you look at the people who have similar or uh, near pro uh, similar propensity scores and try to think of them as comparator group and this multi dimensional problem unbounded problem will mellow down into a single dimension and the single dimensionality comes from propensity score so this is matching people based on propensity score not matching people based on their covariate covariate or matching people based on their characteristic so Aditya, Dr. Singh, I don't know who is moderating. I don't know what is the system. If uh, people have questions, they can stop me in between, or we have to wait for questions till the end. I'm I'm pre I'm pretty okay with any of those. Right? Yeah, there is Praveen here. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, like uh, they will be posting questions in the chat box, and you can uh, uh, respond towards the end of the session. Yeah. Okay. So, so and yeah. at the end of the session, they can ask also. We have some time for question session also. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. i mean and uh, whichever the protocol is i'm fine thank you so uh, so it's not you know think about that whatever you're trying to do of finding a good comparator group is you know in the technical language is called balancing so the most balance you're going are going to get from uh, randomized uh, data or randomized treatment so what does balancing mean balancing mean that on average the Compa comparator group and the treatment group uh the intervention and non intervention group 
are on average similar. If they are on similar, you will say balance. It's on average they are perfectly similar. If true randomization has been done, uh, so what you are going to try to do here through the second best method, which are causa experimental method, is try to balance. And it's not that you know we have no, we, many of you might not have used this term, but you have been doing balancing all your life. Uh, you've been doing regression. So if you do regression models. You add controls there. What are they trying to do is basically they attempt to balance data by including these control variables. So you do go to from univariate regression to multivariate regression. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to balance. You're trying to, if you look at an intervention dummy and say that, and then you add all these controls, what are you trying to do? You're trying to balance the data. After you have accounted for those variables, then you say the intervention and non-intervention groups will be similar, right? Now, so the simplest form of uh, the PSN, the power positive score matching that we are going to use, there are, there are different versions of it, which we, if we get time, we'll talk about a little bit. But the simplest form that we'll use for all this uh, to drive home the point, is going to be the discrete treatment, which will be either you are in treatment or you are not in a treatment. It's not like levels of treatment that you have two days of training, you have five days of training, that will be called multi-level treatment. Uh, there could be continuous treatment that could be days of training. Uh, and that could be, and there also there are matching estimators, which are called generalized propensity score matching. Uh, we can talk about that briefly, but we have not get time to cover all of them, but they are all these uh, different, uh, uh, matching uh, estimations or matching methods that have uh, that have followed the literature. Okay, so so what are the essentials of matching? We are trying to create an artificial comparison group for every possible, and I you see that I've highlighted the word possible, and you will see why I'm saying possible uh, observation that. Why I've highlighted the word possible because there might be some observations in the treatment data for which we'll never find a suitable comparator when we do propensity score matching. And so those will get dropped out. And then that would also lead it to what we are saying in the second part of our talk, which is course and exact matching, where we try to minimize this uh, dropping out of uh, observations which have no match no neighbor, no comparator that can be found based on propensity score, right? So, so that's the, so just to reiterate the propensity score matching method will try to mimic, that's why it's a quasi experimental method. It will try to mimic the randomized assignment into treatment and control groups by choosing the comparison groups those units that have similar propensities to get into treatment. And that is going to be measured in terms of, uh, of uh, propensity score, right? Uh, so the your basis of matching is propensity score. So now just to drive home the message that since propensity score is not a real randomized assignment method, you could say it's a second best method, but uh, pretty useful. It just tries to imitate one. We have not come to the details of how it tries to imitate one, and but we we actually flipped it over and we started by saying it's a quasi-experimental method. I mean, that means it does try to mimic the randomized uh, assignment to the best extent that it can, and that's what we are going to come and see how it does. So it's a quasi-experimental method. It's not an experimental method, right? So two uh, core issues when you try to apply this, which I wanted to highlight from the beginning, uh, matching must be done using baseline characteristics. You cannot do it as the end line data and say, these are the characteristics I'm taking from uh, uh, after the intervention and then generating propensity scores based on that. That will never work because your characteristics themselves are affected by intervention, right? Now, the second bit, which is very important, and you'll see that when we lay out the steps where we start, which is the second one, is the matching method is only as good 
has the characteristics that are used for matching, that is for generating the propensity scores. So it is then from that perspective, it is beneficial to have a large set of characteristics. We still have not spoken about which characteristics are uh, legitimate, which are not. Uh, a lot of papers have been done, which I would uh, send you the references. Uh, in India's case, this was uh, applied uh, so that you have a large set of characteristics based on which you can generate propensity scores. This was a paper by Josna Jalan and Martin uh, Ravalian. Uh, they use NCR IHD data that has a large number of characteristics of the household. So they could generate propensity score based on many of those characteristics. And their intervention was whether you had pipe water, or you did not have pipe water, and they were looking at outcomes related to health, nutrition, and so on. Right? Uh, so, so, the, so, <laughs> so the, what is a propensity score? Let's just reiterate. It is the probability of being assigned to a treatment. Uh, so this is assigned to a treatment in a randomized, which is an experimental method that is already known. If you suppose you randomize by uh, flipping a coin, then and saying that if head comes, then you go into treatment. If uh, tail comes, you go into control. Then you already know the probability of being assigned to a treatment, which will be half, right? If it's a fair coin. But if you have observational data, that's what we are trying to do here we have to estimate this probability uh, that like in the propensity score matching, we need you, we must estimate it because there's no probability that you can say of this being in a treat, uh, this person's probability of getting into treatment, this person's probability of getting into control, uh, we need to estimate it. So, so this will be a probability conditional on the covariates which we're denoting Xi. Uh, so, and then uh, we said that, you know, when on average, if you have uh, similar treatment, similar control, then you're going to be saying it, we are trying to balance. The randomized sample is by structure balanced. If it's a true randomization, to be honest. And, but we are trying to mimic that. That would be the whole exercise that we try to do here. So, so matching, uh, on based on propensity score, what we'll try to do is to balance approximately at least that is try to mimic as much as we can get that on average, the, the treatment group and the control group of who we have matched, who we are trying to match based on propensity score should on average have similar characteristic. I'm re-emphasizing the word on average. Right? It's not that each individual needs to have the same characteristic as the individual in the treatment group as in the control group. It's on an average. And a few slides back, we said that this will propensity score matching uh, will give you or try to try to give you an unbiased estimate of the impact of uh, intervention, impact of uh, program provided some assumptions are satisfied, some conditions are satisfied. And these are, uh, I'm just using the most technical term right now because I'll use the way the literature looks at it and uses all these uh, less technical sounding terms. So, uh, so these are the two critical assumptions in uh, for the PSM to try to mimic as closely as possible the randomized ass assessment sorry, randomized assignment, uh, and then try to get an impact. So the, there are two assumptions. The first one, which is I'm deliberately using the technical term before, when other than that, there are more, there are simpler terms, which will come, same thing, uh, but they're easier to remember, but you should know what, how they are, technically what they are called. They are called, the first one is strongly ignorable treatment assumption. So the, I will come in the next slides to the simpler term, but the simpler terms is also ignorability. Uh, but the full term is strongly ignorable treatment assumption. Then uh, the second one is the stable unit treatment value assumption. So now this is the algebraic form of this that if you look at 
these assumptions, the, the second one that we are, I'm writing is for the expected value of y0, which is the outcome, given x at d equal to one, which is the, you are uh, on based on characteristic when the you are in a treatment that is d equal to one, is equal to the uh, expected value or the outcome. Expected value is nothing but the average. Uh, conditional on the characteristics and when you are in the control group. And the probability of everybody in the being in the treatment group or the control group is always uh, non-extreme. That is between zero and one, right? So, so everybody has a positive probability of participating in the treatment. And, uh, and you know from randomization, everybody has a non-zero probability of being in the treatment. If the, and that's where the true randomization is. And I said that, you know, I took the example of Seva Mandir. I said, uh, by the fact that you chose Seva Mandir and therefore you all your randomized, your five, six, seven randomized uh, uh, evaluation were done there. Your random, uh, Seva Mandir students had a greater probability of being selected than other students. And then you could say that the, my external validity is only for Seva Mandir, but that's not what the papers say. It is for the whole uh, state in Rajasthan and India and so on. So what are the steps to a PSM model? And I'm just going to lay out the overview of steps that you need to do and see that I put it in a kind of a pecking order. So we start from the first step is choice of X variables. What characteristics on which you're going to have data, what you're going to use for uh, are estimating a model of probability to generate the propensity score. That's the first thing, the choice of X variables. Because if everything depends on your propensity score, what variables you have used for generating the propensity score, that become the most focal, that become the most important. That's why we start with the choice of X variables as in a pecking order. That's where you have to start, right? Then we say that we are trying to do, uh, try to mimic the randomized assignment. So we need some kind of a balancing between the what we are comparing, the treatment and the control, or the relevant portions of the treatment and control group, I would rather say, as you'll see in the, uh, in the next slide. Uh, so then we need to have some tests to see that whether it is balanced or not. On average, who we are comparing are similar or not. And then there would be another term that we have to do, which is a common support, which is comes from the technical requirement, uh, that if you are going to compare people based on propensity scores, then this propensity score needs to have some overlap. If people in the treatment group, their estimated probability of getting the treatment are so far away in terms of propensity score, uh, and, and the people in the control group are like really low probability of getting in the, into the treatment, then there is nothing to compare based on propensity score. So that is what the assumption is of common support. So that means there should be some overlap between the propensity score distribution of the treatment group and of the control group. So that's your second step. So first step, you start with the choice of the X variables and it's in a pecking order. Second, you have to check for balancing and we'll talk about how you do it in case of propensity score matching. You have to check for common support. Now, once you have checked for that, that means the data is ready to use. But you need an estimator. You want to estimate the impact of something. Then how do you know? We have got the sample that we can use. It's balanced. Uh, it has a common support. But we now we need an estimator. So after we compare, what will be the metric that will be used for comparing this treatment and control group with balancing support and, co co uh, and common support? And how do we get the estimate? of the impact. So then you have to get with the estimator. The estimator, how you compare the treatment and the control group is the estimator. And that estimator, it gives you the metric for compare, comparing these two. What is the methodology to compare? What is the basis for comparison? So, and if you want to say it in a nutshell, actually, we say propensity score based comparison, but so we say, based on propensity score, I can find a comparator. But what is the rule for finding the comparator? Is it that if you are 0 
difference in the probability of getting into treatment then you are a neighbor you are able you should be compared or if it is 0.05 then you should be compared or there is some other rule that will form the basis for comparison so every estimator that will now get would be about this rule different rules will give you different estimator in trying to find a neighbor find to find a comparator in the propensity score distribution conditional on balancing test and co common support being satisfied and then after we have done that after we get an estimator then we these are all uh, samples so we need some uh, methodology for uh, inference for uh, testing some hypothesis because these are not census data that but our objective is to look at what happens in population is and it's not a, so we need something with external validity we need this uh, test to tell us that whether this is statistically significant or not or is it something just happened because by chance because of the type of sampling we had or things like that just because it was not internally valid it was not externally valid Uh, so we need those kind of statistical tests and for inference these are the method that we have to do these are balancing tests now think about uh, i'm doing it before when we we do this uh, actually the real mechanics of uh, so think about when we say like a neighbor that you know if you are 0.05 points away in probability then you are my neighbor i'll compare this and all those people who have who are who are in that vicinity are my neighbor and they look at the outcomes of this unit in the treatment and compare the outcomes of the average outcome of all those people within the 0.05 of probability and take the difference uh then we are saying that these are uh, this is the this is for one observation then we go to the second observation we do the same thing so i have already set a rule i'm saying 0.05 difference is the rule but different estimators will send you different rules and these are how they are differentiated by setting the rules for comparison who is a comparator group in the propensity score distribution but for balancing uh, uh, test you know that when we compare by doing this we are comparing one person in the treatment group to uh, some people in the comparator group we are not comparing everyone we are not comparing globally we are comparing locally so that's what the balancing will do it will try to slice the propensity score distribution and there will be like different slices think about a pizza and there are different slices so you want to compare things in uh, each of those pizza slices of the propensity score distribution because this is the slice in which people will be compared and i look at one individual i am going to compare him only to the people who are in 0.05 points away in probability in the propensity score distribution so for balance people in that slice should be similar because that's where where i am comparing i'll go to the next slice and then compare so this is how propensity score balancing support or balancing tests are done is that you slice the propensity score distribution into different fragments uh in the fragments in which those uh, individuals are going to be compared from the treatment and control group and from each of those slices you try to see the average of the characteristics in the treatment of the treated individual and the comparator individuals uh and see whether on average they are similar or not and you do it for different slices the optimal number of slices which gives the maximum variation is going to be decided by the program uh but uh, that data has this program when you do the ps score and uh so that you see p score actually that this command will actually do this slicing and give you the balancing test and the common support is that you know there are different ways you can do it through histograms you can do it through kernel density plot and that is do the density probability in the whole plot of the propensity score distribution so this is like a uh a com uh, common support test so the red one is uh, the distribution of the treatment uh, in, in group the propensity score distribution the blue one is for the control group and this is the distribution of estimated propensity score so you see that there are areas in which the propensity scores overlap so we have you will have people who you can compare you will have observation that you can compare and so this has common support now look at with this one you will never find individuals in the treatment and control group who will have similar propensity scores 
you have nothing to compare. You'll have to give up. Unless you change those X variables, generate new propensity scores, there will be a new distribution, there will be overlap, and there will be some common support. Then you can compare. Here, there is nothing to compare. You are at the dead end, actually, in that sense. So this is that this will not satisfy the common support um, condition, and that saves you in the pecking order. Why do you go back to the X variables? Because that's where you started with, uh, because that generates the propensity scores. These are the estimated probability from a model of probability, like a probate or a logit model, which will give you a propensity score. Uh, so this is dependent on what X variables you have put in the model, and that will determine whether they balance, whether there's a common support or not, before you go to the estimator. So that's why it's the pecking order, right? So this is why I just try to summarize by saying, getting down to the brass tacks, the, so start with choice of the covariates. That's the first thing. Which covariates to include? Now, you might say that, oh, this is like a pretty much like a lala land. I don't know what to include. What is the, is there any rule in order to do that? So, so what is your goal? You're trying to predict the selection into treatment. You try to predict the probability of uh, the individuals getting into treatment, the propensity score, right? So, so as in regression, when you do a multivariate regression, right? You always have this quality and quantity trade-off. So it's not that you just have put a kitchen sink and you throw in everything as many variables and, the, and you can keep looking at R square and uh, the, the model keeps improving the R square because you're throwing in more variables. And then you say, oh, this is a getting better model, get a more, better model. That's not the way because you have to trade off quantity versus quality. So, so if you add non-significant covariate, that is fine. You can add non-significant, but you should have a logic that, you know, why are you having that? Does it really affect getting into treatment? Does it affect the outcome? So, so that's the golden rule that when which variables to, and this is also the thing on which your referee or a reviewer will hammer you when you send a paper in a PSM. And you say, these are the variables I use, the covariate that I use to generate the propensity score. Uh, and my common support is uh, well is well done. My uh, uh, balancing is test satisfied. Uh, and I've used these estimators, which I haven't come to as yet. And then we say that, okay, so then you should go home and be happy. We will hammer you. I find you you got all this technicality satisfied, but how come, uh, you know, uh, women's uh, family size a uh, factor in, uh, I don't believe it's a factor in uh, affecting productivity or uh, in uh, getting treatment into training. So I, I don't think it's a legitimate case. So you will have to look for variable that you can defend, which will say can that affect the chance or likelihood of getting into the, any treatment that is of your treatment as well as it gives you, it's a, it affects the outcomes, which would be different in different cases, right? So this is, uh, now Now you will come to the last step, I mean, not last, the second last step actually, because the robustness and inference would be the last step. So there's a lot of matching protocols I'm calling them, but it's think about different matching estimators. Again, as we said that, what is are these matching estimators? This tells you how, which are the uh, groups that need to be compared, the rules for comparing the group. If I set a rule of 0 0.05 P, P score, propensity score difference is a neighbor, then that's a rule. That's an estimator. And then I'll compare the average outcome of people with that 0 0.05 difference in the propensity score distribution to the, uh, to the treatment uh, individual. And that would be one different that I will get. Then go to the second individual, I'll do, apply the same rule, I'll get the second difference. And I keep on doing this, I'll get all the differences and then average the differences. This will be my ATT, average treatment effect of the treatment on the treated. So I'm setting up a rule that is 0 0.05, but it's pretty, kind of rudimentary rule, it's very basic rule. So all these different estimators try to set rules which have certain benefits, certain properties, 
but these are all about how you find a neighbor. How do you find a comparator, uh, the right comparator in the propensity score distribution? So, so there are different estimators. You'll have nearest neighbor matching estimator. There's a kernel-based matching estimator. There's a radius matching estimator, caliper matching, Mahalanobis matching. So there are different, different estimators and which will we'll go into some of them to say, but they're essentially trying to do the same thing. They're trying to set the rules based on which you're going to find a partner or a comparator, right? So when you do a p-score command in Stata, those who are using Stata, there are different commands that you can use for R, that you can do for uh, um, different programs. I'm not getting into that because I mostly use Stata. And most of you might be using it. And uh, only the PS match two, uh, which we have not gotten into, is the ad actually added the Mahalanobis estimator because it's an affine transformation, is a linear transformation. It's a little more involved, we'll not get into it. Uh, and uh, there's something which, you know, some of you might be more uh, acquainted than I am or more updated. Uh, there's an issue of optimal matching that we will discuss in uh, maybe later. And that is the routine has been written in R, but I'm not sure whether it is there in Stata. So, so balancing this is, so that's what you will do. You will slice the distribution and then, uh, so one of the things that uh, we have been doing till now, you'll begin to see that, you know, when you do randomization, the experimental method. So you say on average, uh, on average in terms of characteristics, the people in the treatment group, people in the control group on average would be similar, statistically similar. Now, this is a rule of statistics, right? So you don't, uh, randomization assures you that. And again, I'm emphasizing with there's a true randomization, right? And uh, so, but what we are doing, but when this randomization is there, by the very nature of statistics, it assures you average similarity based on both observed as well as the unobserved characteristics. That's the rule of uh, statistics. But what we are doing here, when we are doing the balancing property, we are only trying to balance based on observed characteristic because we generated the propensity score based on observed characteristics. So the biggest reason because of which these are second best methods is a quasi-experimental method is because these are based on observed characteristics. Randomization, if it is done truly, assures you that there is similarity on average in both observed characteristics as well as unobserved characteristics. So one of the things that there have been some people do in a propensity score matching is what are called Rosenbaum bounds. They try to get some boundary that since we are not able to control for unobserved characteristics, given that is a quasi-experimental method, it is it tries to mimic randomization. We can put boundaries that what is the maximum cost of not being able to control for unobserved characteristics. So you will see this, that uh, these are the Rose, called Rosenbaum bounds, where they try to come up with, uh, with bounds with the maximum possible bias that could be there with the based on observed characteristic, where they try to look at the odds ratio based on someone, uh, based on observed characteristic that is of getting into treatment. And then they try to look at that, you know, uh, the odds ratio will tell you the odds that an outcome given a politic, uh, particular mm -hmm. exposure or treatment it will be compared to the odds of the occurring in the absence of the uh, exposure. Could you just excuse me for a second? I need to change my location for a bit. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just had to. 
change my location for my. This is the problem in Zoom call, right? My daughter's some music class. Anyway, so so they you just try to get these bounds by saying that what are the odds that an outcome given a particular exposure would occur when you compare to the odds of it occurring without this exposure. And that is how it will, you'll get the bounds and it just gives you a rough idea that how bad it is that we are not able to control. So you will not, and we don't overemphasize this because in this world of uh, our cities and the primacy of that, no, there's not so much as, you know, if still in finance literature, people have been using Rosenbaum bounds to a larger extent, but in the mainstream economics literature, you will not find a usage of a lot of uh, these. As I said that, then the questions, now let's come to the brass tax, as I said. People, you come to the mechanical part of it and you know, uh, how much you know sample size we need from where we get the data on characteristics. Um, and uh, so, uh, so the, the, the rough rule of thumb is that if you have 1,000, 1,500, this is what, uh, because, because of all the slicing and other thing of the propensity score distribution, if you have a very small sample, uh, you will see that in each of those slides where you're looking for balancing and common support, uh, you are going to get like really small sample. So that's not uh, going to work. So that's why you just take it as a rough rule of thumb that you have uh, at least 1,000 to 1,500 uh, a sample size that you know is kind of uh, kosher or is kind of acceptable. As I said there would be then other things like about multi-level matching on continuous uh, uh, treatment. Those things are in place, uh, but uh, you know we are not covering those. Uh, so th all these things are in uh, as when you uh, estimate the impact, which will come to. Do you want to use? Uh, Sample pop, sample weights, population weights, on the final estimates that you do in a sample survey all the time. It all depends on uh, how, to what extent your representativeness of the sample is there. Uh, so if that's what you know. It leaves us to see if it makes sense. Then you could use uh, population weights to say that this is what we can weigh the the thing that we estimate by the population weights to get it for a overall population or target population that we're trying to do. So, so this, before we get out of there and get into this real cases, just remember this re to reiterate, matching must be done using baseline category. I've seen a lot of things that intervention has been done and then after the intervention, the survey is being done and then people are using matching estimators to get the estimate. It's not going to be acceptable. It's not going to pass the, even the smell test as to say, right? Second thing that you always have to remember, the matching method is only as good as the covariates that are you even use to generate your propensity scores. And, uh, and I told you that you should look at this uh, for detailed covariant thing, and I had put in there as well that you should look at these papers that um, are, okay. So what are the, the data requirements? So the thing that you are going to look for data for those variables, I'm just summarizing in a lot of ways. And these are the references for that. If you look at the Heckman and Chumura on Todd paper, which gives you this guideline. Uh, just like in regression, you should be looking for variables that are going to be both uh, affecting the probability of getting into a treatment as well as it should be related to the outcome variables, right? Now, as we the summarize that, we said started with saying that, you know, when you're going to the one of the first principles in uh, any evaluation is that to the extent possible, uh, invoke double difference because we did the example that we're looking at uh, the outcome and there's some drought stuck or something is stuck in between and then you are going to be having a real bias estimate of uh, the intervention so we have to strive for double difference to the extent possible so right now till whatever we were talking it could be done in cross-sectional one period data 
But suppose you do this thing, uh, you have data in the baseline for treatment and control. You also have a data for um, baseline and uh, sorry, for treatment and control in the end line. Uh, but you have a basis that these are not randomly as assigned treatments. So you have to rely on quasi experimental methods. You will not, being a second fiddle to the randomized control or experimental methods, you're not going to get there, but you can at least try to mimic. And in this case, that if you have such data, then you will do a double difference PSM. Uh, you'll do a double difference propensity score matching where instead of just the outcome of treatment and control on the average of the match ones, you will do it as a different, just like we had this example of Y1 minus C1 minus Y0 minus C0. The gap, uh, the difference in the outcome between treatment and control in the match sample and the difference in the outcome in the treatment and control in the baseline and the difference of this in the match sample would be your double difference propensity score matching. And that at least when you do this uh, double difference, and you can see that at least those unobserved factors, which are constant over time, will be really taken care of, will be filtered out. So that is something which, you know, if you have data like that, you will move from for all that mechanic with the balancing, common support, all those things will apply. When you go to the estimation step, whatever estimator we have not come to that we're going to use, then uh, that is going to be the idea of, uh, uh, of uh, doing a double difference uh, propensity score matching model. Now, after you do this, if you go to what are the matching uh, estimators, so simplest is nearest neighbor matching. That you set up a bandwidth, just like I was saying 0 0.05. And then you say that all those observations for each treatment unit, though are, those who are in 0 0.05 units in probability, propensity score away, they would be compared. Then 0 0.07, 0 0.05, so people uh, do this by co-robustness, they look at one, three, five matching. They look at one neighbor and compare, they look at three neighbors and compare, they look at five neighbors and compare, and then just uh, take the difference in outcomes in all of those cases, and then average the difference of those outcomes, then you get your ATT. The kernel-based matching, as I said, the different estimators are different rules for uh, saying that who is your neighbor, who is your uh, uh, comparator. A kernel-based matching is, it says that it looks at the propensity score distribution, goes to one uh, treatment unit, and then looks at all the treatment units around it. And based on the distance in the propensity score, the it, it, kernel is nothing but a weighting scheme. It gets higher weights to those observations or those uh, uh, non-participants who have propensity score, who are nearer in the propensity score distribution and gives lower weight to uh, those uh, in the propensity score distribution who are near, but those who have a, have a much different propensity score. So that would be a kernel-based matching. If you do a radius matching, you draw a radius around, a circle around every observation, and with a certain radius, and that radius matching will be dependent on the radius that you have. And then you see that within everyone in that radius would be included in the, as comparator. So you see that all these different rules are basically generating different estimators. Is that basically they are nothing but trying to tell you who's a neighbor, who's a comparator. That is the essence of different estimators. They'll say kernel-based matching estimator, nearest neighbor matching estimator, then uh, Mahalanobis, not a linear regression matching estimator. So there, everything is about the rule in based on which you you're going to have uh, the. Okay, so so that's why I say that if you look at the choice of matching estimator, nearest neighbor caliper matching, so different match estimators they do this and every you know nothing in economics or statistics come for free, right? 
So what will happen is that every estimator that you will move from one to the other, depending on the structure of the data, depending on the, the propensity score that you do, there will be some trade-offs. Some estimator, you and the main trade-off that you need to remember is between variance and bias, right? So you try to minimize the bias. If you have more and more uh, uh, observation that you are trying to compare with, you might be useful in reducing the bias, but with more and more observations, you'll get the more variance of the estimator. And if you took five from this side or you took seven from this side and seven from that side, that will give you more variance. So yes, your estimator would be less precise. So this we are not going to get into detail just to say all of these estimators can be implemented very easily in, in different software. Uh, but you need to know all the theory and all the things that we talked about. This is all about the different rules and the, the programs implemented uh, uh, pretty easily. A different command for this and you can just do and then just get a, a different estimators for it. Right. And uh, so, uh, so that's what I said. There are a lot of these I mean, because of the time because we also want to come uh, you cover uh, CM, the course and exact matching, which will be the next step from, uh, it's not like a next step in a, in a vertical scale, but uh, you'll see that in some way it is, in some way it is not. And they always trade off, you know, you take a method that, uh, uh, so, so these are just, uh, I mean, this is a little bit of algebra if anybody needs that these are, these are different estimators. Uh, that you'll see that you, if you see that thing that we have put in that kernel, you can see it is is a basically a W is basically the weight. So you look at the control group and the difference between the treatment and the control group. If your J is uh, running from over C, uh, which is over control group. So the moment you are as different in outcome from uh, the control group, you'll get a lower weight. So it's a weighting system. And that is your kernel estimator. So these are the weights that, you know, and you don't have to do anything. These are all done by software, but this is just to know the theory behind it. How estimators, the different kind of propensity score matching estimators exist. These are nothing but different rules for saying who's a neighbor, who's a comparator, what is the system, that is what it uh, gives you. This is, as I said that, you know, I can, uh, send to all of you different estimators, but basically uh, if there, are, there are about six, seven, eight estimators that are there, but essentially, and that is the take home message that I want you to be with, they actually uh, will provide you different rules for saying who is to be uh, compared and in what way. Uh, with that, these are the rules that will actually uh, tell you uh, different estimators they do exactly and every and it's not like a blanket rule for saying which estimator you could do because every estimator they move from one to the other there will be some trade-off particularly in the case of variance and bias uh, so what you do in papers you actually do different uh, methods in order to, for saying our results are robust to using different estimators because uh, if they because there's a variance bias trade-off uh, so we could just uh, work with this, right? Now the last bit that is we have not talked about, so we have talked about all the steps, but remember the last steps in the set of steps that we had, which will be about inference. So you estimated this. So all these things, the estimation that we have made, uh, and we say this is the impact by doing all this whole elaborate set of steps with common support, balancing property, generating the propensity scores, uh, different estimators that we try to even take to different estimators. How do we know that these are statistically significant or not? The impact that you have got, is it statistically significant or not in the sense that, is it just like a kind of oddness of the sample that is coming out or is there a, real relationship that we have estimated, real effect or impact that we have estimated 
that exists in the population. Right? So, so we need some statistical test or inference in order to answer that question. So all of you have some basic uh, idea of regression statistics and all. So the way you do statistical tests that, you know, these are all standard error based tests. So if you, uh, if you, any estimate that you have generated, if you, suppose you did it over and over again, and you get like huge variation over time, then you will be not be very sure of your estimate. So this sample give me an estimate of 0 0.5. Uh, the ATT is 0 0.5. I go to the other sample or the next time I do it, I will do sampling with replacement, without replacement, different cases. And my estimate is 0 0.7. So if you have this so much of variation, you can never be confident. So you will not be so confident about your estimate that this is a true impact. So you want uh, standard errors or the variation or standard deviation of the estimate to be low. Right? And then only because it's a statistical analysis, it's not that we are uh, doing a census and every unit has been covered. So we don't have any uh, sampling error or non-sampling error that because we are doing a, uh, it's a sample based estimation of the impact. So we need something for inference, right? The inference would need that if you do the simple regression, what do you do? You do a t-test with the coefficient and as I said that, you know, you want standard errors to be low for each value of the coefficient that you say the impact is 0 0.5 for that big difference between the two. Uh, what is the certainty? What is the variation, the standard error? So now you'll see that in all these estimators, we have never talked about standard errors. But how can we do uh, inference? Right? Now remember that standard errors will be generated because you're doing different statistical exercises. You are uh, doing the exercise of one estimation is generating the propensity score. The second uh, level you do the matching, right? That's another statistical exercise. So standard errors, some depending on the which sample you took, what, what was the sign, there will be some errors generated there. So what happened in all these uh, estimators that you have, because the standard errors are generated at different levels, you don't have a formula for standard errors. So there are no closed form formula for standard errors in the, these estimators. So most of the time that you will estimate this models, and when you say the impact is 0.5, and you say, oh, so what is the standard error? So Stata will, or any program will give you some standard error. You will never know where did it come from because there's no formula. Uh, they would have written something uh, and then the standard error would come at based on which you would determine whether it is statistically significant or not. And you will have some inference based on that, that it is there in the population. Uh, and it's a true impact, right? So, all these estimators, what the way they will generate the standard error is through what in statistics we call bootstrapping. When you don't have a closed form solution or a formula for the standard errors, so bootstrapping is basically that you know, you from the sample, you uh, derive a subsample, then uh, you estimate, then you draw another subsample, then you re estimate, and then keep on seeing the, how the standard errors are generated. Once they start converging and they converge to some value uh, where the next draw is very, very, very near to this, you said those are the standard errors. So it will depend on how many replications you make. So for all the things that we're doing in PSM, the, at least the practice, what is accepted practice, would be that when you do bootstrapping for generating standard errors, Though bootstrapping would uh, uh, require, or which is acceptable, would require a minimum of 1,000 replications. Uh, and this 1,000 replications, when they start converging, you say this is the standard error based on which you'll do your statistical test and say, okay, this effect is uh, significant that we have estimated through propensity score matching. So, so that is the idea there. And uh, 
so uh, we have done this so that's the idea so i just uh, uh, just you know, like in a very brief like you know what are the main commands in stata that will do this for the just go to the steps when we are generating the propensity scores and uh, that will come from p score command which will also conduct the balancing test when you will do that it it will divide and it will say in segment 1 balancing test not satisfied when it divided into different segment and i can give you a forewarning if you have a large data set sometimes it can be very frustrating of balancing test being met being satisfied and this i say always in all this uh, which is totally not uh, assessed through any impact evaluation is that this balancing test gets uh, satisfied much more easily even women are doing it compared to men i mean some of the paper that we were doing i really struggled when the balancing property and the moment uh, we ran it through a lady it just worked so this is a this is one hypothesis that if you want to test or there's no scientific explanation for it except that maybe women are themselves more balanced so and um, so the whole idea is uh, and there this com uh, command for each of those estimator that we see which are different rules for match uh, for finding the comparator for the nearest neighbor matching nn match and the reason that i'm bringing in nn match specifically so since i have talked about bootstrapping because bootstrapping is needed for all these other estimators then abadi and imbens in the paper in 2006 i guess um so they developed an estimator nearest neighbor matching estimator uh where they derived the close form solution where there was a formula for the standard error so it the, what the stata will give you from nn match and nn match 2 actually would be actually which are called analytical standard error that is means which are derived from a formula it's not run through bootstrapping so now at least for all because of that advantage every estimator that will people will do they will definitely do nn match because nn match gives you analytical standard errors it's not based on bootstrapping so so these are the things and uh, i and how, how much time did you do i have so i just want to plan accordingly um pravin you are my moderating i don't know who the yeah devesh maybe um, 10 minutes more maximum if you can just uh, okay that, yeah please yeah i'm i'm sorry I, my time management is no, no it's fine it's fine so it's um fine, but, yeah. uh, so other thing is that when you do this i mean you could have always see that you know we were doing uh, things talking about uh, everything that we were talking about it seemed like an ex post assessment that you know after the intervention has happened and then we are looking at there is an intervention now what we did in one paper and we also want to propagate uh, that provincial score matching could be also very useful for your ex ante impact assessment something that intervention has not yet happened you have to make a, and these questions come up in policy research so if you uh, think about this whole agriculture technology this so if the say government of punjab wanted to say that oh you can only do these varieties of seeds because these are late sowing and you wanted to know the impact of that that would be that you know even if this thing has not been implemented you wanted to know what will be the impact uh, you want to do the ex ante assessment so so then you also you can use propensity score matching so we did it case for uh, avian flu so there were countries in which avian flu had not struck and uh, our objective was to know what would happen to uh, farmers incomes what would happen to uh nutrition of uh, the consumers and farmers if if from provinces if sorry even flu were to strike so this is totally ex ante assessment so we had to now we said how do we do this so we said okay let's just use provinces score matching to address this question so the idea is that if you have a big data like your nss data situation assessment survey uh 
where uh, there is a very big data. A lot of people are there in farmers in a different state. So we had like poultry farmers. Some of them have big flock. Some people have small flock. Some people did not have poultry. Some people had poultry. Same way on the uh, So now I want to see the effect. So we said avian flu is what? Is a, from an economics point of view, is it a supply shock or a demand shock? So it's a supply shock means the number of birds will go away. They will have no birds or their number of birds will reduce. The birds would die or would be culled. And there would be a demand shock that the price at which the poultry was being sold would now go and come down. So we had in the data people selling prices at different poultry, people with big flocks, small flocks. So we matched people with big flocks and similar people with a small flock. And they, we wanted to see the impact of small flock by matching these people where by getting their proper probability of holding a small flock, a propensity score. And then we match people in the big flock and small flock and said the big flock people really proxied for the people without avian flu. And after avian flu, they became like small flock. So the effect of this reduction in flock size because of avian flu would be, was then estimated. And they do different estimated. And these are ex-ante impact assessment questions you will get all the time when you are dealing with uh, technology and different agriculture interventions. And that would be the uh, reason I'm not going to detail, but I say that you could use this also for a lot of these uh, policy questions that are going, that would come in, in there. Okay, and the last bit, and before that, I'll just, uh, you know, because I'll take five minutes to talk about CM after this, but one, uh, uh, so I'm just saying that maybe with uh, propensity score matching, if there are any questions, this might be the right moment to ask now, or you want me to just do a five, 10 minutes or whatever is remaining for the CM. Uh, and then we can just uh, have the questions after that. Either way it is fine. These are some of the references I have put in for uh, PSM, but I have a much bigger list. If anybody is interested, then you can, I just put in the critical one, but there are, a lot of things which are there on double difference and double difference PSM. Uh, and we have not talked about the continuous treatment. We have not talked about multi-level treatment and all, which are also uh, because we couldn't cover in the time that uh, we had. Um, but those are there and we can always uh, kind of interact. Anybody needs papers on that suggestion, uh, I would be the happiest to do it. I mean, so please feel free to write. I think Professor Singh can, or someone can give you my email uh, and you can do that as well. So uh, I'm this side, you know, uh, as I said that this, you know, this one and a half hours is pretty low for uh, this thing, but I'll just try to within the, you know, matching apart from the different uh, multi-level matching or continuous treatment matching, uh, which are called generalized propensity score matching. Those are all there. Uh, but within propensity score matching, even going to the different levels, even if you looked at the same binary treatment, there's a new development that happened, which is called coarse and exact matching. So remember what happens in, and we said that, you know, we need common support. Uh, and this, uh, only when you have common support, you have someone to match. And so the thing is that, you know, if you don't have common support, and then you're looking at the slices of uh, uh, those propensity score distribution for doing the balancing. So what happens is that it is quite possible that there will be some observations that would get dropped. They would never find, they would never find a match. Now go back to the first slide that we're talking about. We tried to solve the problem. I said the two core challenges in impact evaluation are basically confounding factors and selection bias. So there was some selection that some people were getting more selected over other because of self-selection or because of external selection. Now, when you do propensity score matching and with all these mechanics that we went through, you're going to drop someone, someone will never find a match. So is it because of the way that you have done the variables uh, that 
it raises the probability of not finding match and uh, that could lead to some you wanted to con like, account for bias and then you might introduce a bias because of what is uh, what you're doing through this whole process trying to match because some you know some have certain characteristics that definitely have those low probability of ever finding a match so some people or some observations some beneficiary non beneficiaries have a, a greater probability of not getting the treatment that means you will you are creating a selection issue there so in relation to that this is the king at all i mean the, uh, they came up with something which is called coarse and exact matching which is cem uh, so think about the thought experiment uh, that if you have a data and i'm trying to find a match between people about years of education so 7 years 5 years 9 years and and compare uh, a case where i'm just i will coarsen the data i will make it little not that fine i'll coarsen it i'll say oh no i'm not going to match on based on years of education i'm going to match people based on whether they are primary secondary high school college right so you can immediately begin to see that in the former case it's much harder to match find a match when you course in the data like high school middle school like that it might be easier to find it so whether you went to high school whether you went to middle school there might be many more people because you get a bigger bigger segment of people in which you to find a match so that's called coarsening the data so just from the intuition point of view when you coarsen the data you increase the chance of finding matches that's why it's called coarse and exact matching it will do in a certain way that you know you'll try to find exact matching for matching for everyone in some way uh, but this is just to give you a little bit of a background the 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 so called technology which is behind this and the and then that will be the the matching done with coarse and data uh and that is that will also raise the chances of finding a match and it will also reduce the chances of someone just getting dropped out because they uh they will not never find a match because uh, they would those characteristics are so defined now that it will be a lower probability of that happening so which means there will be a lower probability of a selection issue coming up right so any this is an alternate conceptualization of the observational data uh, so every data you know as i said that you know take the education example there are some natural break points which is here this is because i took it from the king's paper that's why they have the american and but we also have that high school middle school uh, which is uh, they have the grade school high school college like so if you define the categories like that it might be much easier to find a match and it will be much lower chance of some people not finding a match and leading to a selection issue so so that is the idea this is so what the king calls it that you know is uh, what uh, other people will call it as the att or basically satt which is sample average treatment effect of the treatment on the treated he makes the point that this is basically not that in psm what you are doing is basically a feasible sattt so he calls it f sattt that's what you are doing and that's that's the motivation for so because you have all these issues that you would have some issues not some observations not finding a match then uh, some they are actually getting totally uh, dropped out leading to a selection issue so you are uh, basically you started by saying that we trying to reduce this bias from selection you might end up trying the uh, variation for right so so the i'll just take two slides and then i'll stop uh, and seriously i would uh, and i've reiterated many times that you know any of this question these are little 
uh, CM when you start doing these are pretty little technical. And uh, so I, but uh, I would be very happy that if you uh, want to do this implementation in software is even your grandmother can do it. There is just, there's nothing that, you know, there is, you cannot do it just, and it will, it will happen in a jiffy, right? So, so the point that, you know, from a theoretical perspective, and this is the weakness of PSM that it tries to approximate a completely randomized experiment rather than with matching methods a more, it says fully block randomized experiment. So blocking is what? Blocking is, an arrange, is the arrangement of experimental units in groups, right? It is trying to do all these things by you're doing this by block by block and so on but it tries to do the randomization kind of mimicry in as if it is a, a, a global a exercise, right? And that's where the imbalance comes. And that's what the coercent exact matching tries to do by coarsening the data. It actually needs to block wise randomization in terms of in, 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 in spirit. It's a, an, and you will see that you know how they you does the exact matching, and I'm not going to do here because I have only that much time. But CST, this is something not very difficult. It's just technical that you have to look at for matching. You have to look at not in terms of one dimension. Then you have to look at the variables on a cuboid uh, because you have to do exact matching. And these are things. I mean, it's not difficult at all to be honest. Uh, not difficult to implement uh, at all. You'll find it's, it's a very recent development from 2016 and onwards, you don't have a lot of papers uh, who have used, which have used this. Um, and, uh, but there is uh, something that you can uh, uh, really very basic idea is uh, all that, you know, for coarsening the data and the puning observation. So, so I, so I would uh, stop there. Uh, this is all in the slides, and uh, so I'll just, uh, it's a pro thing. is it okay to stop now and we just open for questions? Yes, there is sure. I think uh, we can just have a few questions. Students, quickly ask, please unmute, and uh, quickly we can have one or two questions, please. I mean, that uh, there's been one or two questions is very much an issue of variance versus bias. <laughs> we already have a few questions in the chat box. Please, you can have a look on that answer. So, <laughs> yeah. Sir, I want to ask one question, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, I am doing my research on FPO, sir. Impact of FPOs, FPO operations on FPO members. Yeah. Uh, sir, actually, I want to uh, find the impact between the FPOs who are undertaking trading business, who are undertaking post-production active business activities like uh, direct marketing mm. and, and value addition activities. So I, I want to compare the impact of FPOs across the, their business line activities. Uh -huh. In this case, whether I have to take a non-FPO as a control group or FPO performing the trading business alone as a control group. Yeah, no, no, uh, that, 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 uh, two, two levels. I mean, that is very nice, but you know, uh, what you are actually working in, that is the issue that, you know, we have been trying to push in FPOs. Uh, this is something which I think is very valuable, what you're doing. And I, let me tell you in what context, and then I'll come to from the method side. Uh, because much of the FPO discussion is always about this distribution of value, how much farmer gets, whether his income goes up or not. But very little is done on kind of creation of value. That yes, whether yes, going to product dis uh, differentiation, whether you're going to value addition, right? Post harvest. So it's a very important research question from that perspective on which you know the impact evaluation is very much needed. And because 
much of the literature is all about you are a member you are a non member uh, yeah, what yeah. the in, increase in income of the farmer or what is the adoption of technology of the farmer and so on right now to think is that you know when you said that what will be my comparator group i mean i should do within the fpos those who are adopting uh, say value addition practices or post harvest practices and those who are not right or it is so these are basically you remember that you know they are always in uh, treatment there are there can be different arms of treatment right so you can uh, look at the evaluation from this for one arm whether you are fpo or not fpo which is the standard thing right and then uh, you look at uh, the you have another treatment i mean another treatment arm which would be whether you do engage in post harvest and value addition activities or not so yes, the yes, sir. depending on the question there you your you know uh, you will have a different uh, propensity score generated for that right and your different uh, controls so, so what one way you can do is 